So last week, I introduced this book that I'd been reading called With by Sky Jathani. And um, I, I really like this book because what it, what it has done for me is helped me think about how important it is to God that we see our relationship with Him as a, a partnership, which seems kind of odd, you know, we've been talking about this for a, a few weeks, but in the sense, not in the sense that like it's an equal partnership, obviously, right? I mean, God is God and we're not. But in the sense that God, remember we talked about Adam and Eve last week, God put Adam and Eve in this world to take care of the world, to name the animals, to take care of the ground, to make sure that everything that He put in place they actually ruled over in his place. He was, Adam was, in a sense, God's first priest on earth, if you think of it that way, partnering with him, helping him, the, the one that mediates between heaven and earth. It's a, it's a crazy, crazy concept because what we have done is we've moved away from this idea that God wants us to go forth with him. And we know this is true when we think about it because He has died on the cross so that He could give us salvation but has placed His Spirit in us to walk through this life with us. And yet, for whatever reason, we look at this uh, connection with God, this religion with God, this following after God as anything but a relationship with God. And that's what the whole book deals with is different ways that we try to do this thing called faith. One way we looked at last week, it was when we were looking at Adam and Eve, is this idea of over, that, that we oftentimes, certainly Adam and Eve took from the tree they weren't supposed to take from, they placed their will over God. And we do this all the time. In, in fact, over God is a position that often you would think, well, people that don't really have much of a faith would do that. They just do their life the way they want to do it. They certainly wouldn't have God over them. They would either not even believe in God or certainly would use God in, in their day-to-day -day activities. The reality is, though, you and I do this. We do. I mean, just look at Peter. Peter's life, he loved Jesus. He walked with Jesus. He, he, he was one of Jesus' closest, closest friends. And yet, on the night that, that Jesus said was coming, I have to be arrested. I have to be put to death. I will raise again. He shares this complete plan of God. They all know it. Peter certainly knows it. But on the night that he is arrested and the guards are coming with torches and they could hear the approach and, and they're there with all this loud clamor and, and they're all in the garden wanting to so badly protect Jesus. But knowing Jesus said, this has to happen. Peter can't help himself. He draws a sword and he attacks one of the guards. Now, fortunately, he just wounded him. Jesus was able to heal him, put a stop to it all. And eventually, Jesus willingly went with them as a prisoner. But Peter took matters into his own hands, right? That's what Peter did. Even though he was told, that's not the plan, Peter. That's not what I told you was supposed to happen. And, and yet, in this situation, I think we can understand that Peter acted out of impulse, right? I mean, we've got to give Peter a little bit of a break because we've all acted out of impulse. You ever been, uh, you've ever been cut off by somebody else in a vehicle? And, and have you ever acted out of impulse? Maybe, maybe you laid on the horn when you're not really a horn person, but you were on that horn. Or maybe you used creative hand gestures. Right? Or maybe you, you sped up. Anybody here speed up and like, you're going to go after him now. What is this, Starsky and Hutch? For some of you, you're like, Starsky and who? What? Old 70s show. I did, they did remake that. Maybe you do know it. I don't know. They did a movie. I don't know if it was any good. So, so <laughs> we, we have all acted out of impulse. You know, when you're at your daughter's game and the ref makes a really bad call and hypothetically acting out of impulse. We've all done that. So, Peter, you know, we can excuse this, right? And yet, and yet, in that same night, in that same night, Peter follows Jesus at a distance so he's not caught. Jesus goes into the inner court through the gates of the high priest's home. Jesus can't get in there, so he stays outside around a fire pit where the servants are and tries to blend in. Only he doesn't do a good job because he's called out three different times. 
at three different points in the evening, somebody comes up to him and says, hey, you're one of those Galileans, right? You're with Jesus, right? You're one of them. And G Peter's like, no, I don't know who he is. And he has time to think about how he responds in this moment because he has three chances. This is where it gets real dangerous to be over God because we've all been there where we deliberately make a choice to do it our way. Am I right? I mean, I, not everything is being cut off or a bad ref call. Sometimes we actually think through and plot out and consider and weigh and still make that choice to do it our way. That's living over God. That's not living with God. And so, I want to talk about another way this morning that we move away from being with God. This is so easy for us to see because we all do it. This one's harder because it looks good. In fact, it is good. There are, there are times where being under God, absolutely, there are right ways to be under God, but there certainly are wrong ways. I want us to deal with the ways that move us away from being with God. Let's talk about ways that you are supposed to be under God and still with Him. In fact, we'll just list those out. When being under God is good, under the Lordship of Jesus, Jesus should be Lord of your life. He should be the one sitting on your the heart throne. Absolutely. Under the control of the Spirit. Certainly. You should be influenced by Him. In fact, we're even told in the Bible you should be under His control. That He should be able to, to instruct you and give you wisdom and give you His mind. And this one, under the conviction of God. Now, we don't like the word conviction because it's like, ah, God is telling us, no, you're wrong. But that's so good, like a good parent. A bad parent doesn't care what their kids do. God loves you so much that He's going to lead you and correct you. So this is awesome. This is good. And all of these, all three of these, are ways in which Jesus was trying to teach His followers to do life with Him. So these are not bad under God. These are good under God. Living, living under these lordship and the conviction and the control, this is good stuff. I want to talk about, though, when it's not. When is living under God something that is not what God really wants because it pulls us away from living with Him? We're supposed to do life with Him. We're supposed to walk with Him. The best way that I know how to explain this, and we're going to go back to Peter because he shows us a great example of this, but the best way I know how to explain this is to, to give us a little cheat sheet. Here's a little cheat sheet. If you can read that, it's real tiny. Over God is like, I know better than God. You would never say that out loud unless you, know, you just blatantly are in rebellion against God. Most of us would not say that. I know it's better in this situation, but don't we do that? The way we live, I know better than God. By our choice, by the words we say, by what we allow ourselves to dwell on. When He teaches us a different way and He wants us so badly to place ourselves in His truth and walk in His truth and be set free by His truth, I know better than God. Well, the way to think about under God is this way. Again, tiny words, but it says, I'm afraid I'm not good enough. I'm afraid. Now, there's a healthy fear. The fear of the Lord's the beginning of all wisdom, but there is not a healthy fear. And it's the fear that God is going to punish me for every wrong choice that I make. And I live constantly in this state of feeling un worthy because I can never live up. And when you're under this kind of system that, that, that is a, a law system, it's a, it's a system of, of, of performance. I've got to do for God because I don't feel worthy enough in myself. Let me give you Peter's example and then see if this at all connects with you because it's actually possible to do both living over God and under God at the same time. Usually it starts here feeling unworthy and trying to prove yourself to God and you start doing things that you weren't supposed to do because you don't feel worthy. This is Peter's life. Okay, so after Jesus has been arrested and after he is inside the high priest's home and Peter's on the outside around the fire and they're accusing him, when it all ends, after the third time, this is what we read happens in Peter. And he went outside and wept bitterly. Weeping bitterly is probably, if you think about it, the strongest words 
that you can that you can find in the Bible describing somebody's inner turmoil and emotions. Can can you think of another one? I mean, even Jesus, when when Lazarus is dead, his good friend is dead, and he feels such sorrow and such compassion for the people. All that we read, you know, this it's the shortest verse in the Bible. He wept. But you come to Peter in this moment, and he doesn't just weep. He runs away and he weeps bitterly. He's destroyed. What has destroyed him? Well, if we read up to this moment, it's, it, there, there's a certain point at which everything changes in, in what Peter is feeling. Because if we just go to the third time somebody accuses him, Peter replied, man, I don't know what you're talking about. That's the third time he says it. Up to this point, he, he has not yet felt these emotions. He's trying to cover, he's trying to cover, he's trying to make excuses. Maybe the first two times he's kind of keeping his voice low because, because he, he can still see Jesus through the gate. And he, he doesn't want Jesus to hear, but in another translation, it doesn't say, man, I don't know what you're talking about. It says, Peter called down curses on himself. I swear I don't know the man. And that's when... Just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. The Lord turned around and looked straight at Peter. They connected eye to eye. And Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him. This was in the upper room as they were having the Last Supper. Before the rooster crows today, Peter, you will disown me three times. Before morning breaks, you will deny knowing me. And Peter went out and wept what's not recorded here, but we know in that conversation that Jesus had with Peter, Peter is adamant, no, Lord, that will never, ever, ever happen. Even if everyone here, if they run away, if they deny you, it, I will not, I am your man. And yet, he blew it. He didn't keep his commitment. He wasn't able to stay strong. Just running away is just like an exclamation point on the fact that he already abandoned him and denying him once, twice, three times. What Peter is feeling in this moment is tremendous disappointment in himself. And this is important for us God is supposed to, if we're making Him Lord of our life, if we're walking with Him, making Him Lord of our life, He is supposed to convict us of wrong. Conviction comes from guilt. Guilt is realization that, oh, I did wrong. It is fully focused on our behavior, and conviction says, I need to change, want to change, and determine to change my behavior. I am being convicted of this. I need to turn this around. I need to repent. It is healthy. It hurts like crazy when God convicts us, but that guilt is important and that guilt is good. This is not guilt. This is shame. You can just write shame right next to this. Because shame says, remember, guilt is I'm disappointed in my behavior. That's healthy. We need God to tell us when we are not in line with His will. Shame says, I'm disappointed in myself. I am not good. I am bad. I am not able to do what I promised that I was able to do. And Peter is wrestling with his own worth before Jesus. He feels bitter about himself. He doesn't know what to do. He failed. And instead of realizing that all of us fall short of the glory of God, he feels like a failure. That he could never, ever repay this. And that's the problem. He can't make it up to his Lord. 
The Lord is about to be crucified. He can never even say, I'm sorry. He can never make amends. He can never do enough. And that's the problem. When you live under God and under the laws of God and under the rules of God only and not in relationship with Him and, and not in love with Him and not trusting that that relationship's going to be there no matter what we do and how we fail and what we mess up with, when we are totally dependent upon that, that, that performance that we have to do more for God, that we have to prove our worth, we will never, ever, ever measure up. It'll never be enough. This is what Peter's struggling with. And this is what shame does. It discards self. And so, when we come back to this model, living under God is a good thing when you're living under the Lordship of Christ and under His conviction and you use guilt or God, let God use guilt to correct you. But when you live under shame, there's a really dark underbelly of, of, of being under God and under shame and under performance and under law. And that really dark underbelly is not just what it does to you, but it, what it does in your heart, but what it does in your mind because you start to believe that your works can actually change God's mind about you. And you begin to manipulate God. God, wasn't I good enough? Why didn't you heal that person? Wasn't I good enough? Didn't I do enough good here? And this is where Peter struggled. And the reason why oftentimes he found himself over God because he was doing things to prove to God. Think about how, how, how often in Peter's life he was always trying to be first and always trying to prove. And at one point, Jesus even has to get a hold of him and say, get behind me, Satan. You don't have the things of God in mind. You have the things of men in mind here. Peter constantly struggled with this. When is being under God not good? When we're under the law of God instead of grace? Which relates to the second one, under a religious system instead of a relationship? Oh, God wants a relationship with you so bad. And thirdly, under the delusion that God can be figured out. This one we're not going to deal a whole lot with, but we could spend a lot of time here. Think about Job and all his sufferings, and he had three friends come, and, and they all shared this great advice, right? At least in their own mind, they thought it was great advice. Think about this. Job's friends were good moral men. They just were wrong about God. They didn't have him figured out because you can't figure out God. You can't make God perform for you. You can't do enough for God. These two are what Peter really struggled with, especially the idea of relationship. Jesus walked with Peter every day and wanted so badly to show him, abide in me, remain in me, be connected to me. Peter, no matter what's coming. And, 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 and think about this. The reason that Jesus told Peter what was about to happen was so that Peter would be prepared for it. And if Jesus still loves Peter, even though Jesus says, Peter, you're going to deny me three times, that means Jesus cares about Peter and is preparing him. It took a while for Peter to get this, Right? I mean, you, you remember what happened when Jesus rose from the grave and the women found the tomb empty and the angels told them. They ran back to the house where all the others were. There were a whole bunch of people in the upper room. Peter runs out of the house. In fact, he gets into this race with John trying to get to the tomb first. He has to be first, and he is first. He must prove to his Lord that he is worthy of forgiveness. On the beach, Jesus is cooking breakfast and they're on the boat and as they're fishing, they see Jesus and they realize that's the Lord. And as soon as Peter hears it's the Lord, he jumps into the water and swims like crazy to the shore. He must be the first one at Jesus' feet. Jesus, you need to see how much I'll do for you. Peter doesn't get it yet. So Jesus takes Peter aside after breakfast and he says to him, Actually, ask him three questions. And they're pretty much the same three questions that correspond to pretty much the same 
three denials. So, so Jesus, Peter denies Jesus three times, but they're pretty much the same denial. Jesus asks him three questions, and those three questions are, are basically this. I'll just give you the last one. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? That's the question. Here's what, here's what uh, Jesus did not ask Peter. These questions were completely left out. Jesus could have asked him these questions, but he left these questions out. What were you thinking? Why didn't you do more? Why can't you be like John? Why do you think I should let you back in? When are you going to get your life together? Why do you keep messing up? He didn't ask any of those. He simply asked, do you love me? One of the hardest lessons for us to get is the lesson of grace. And the lesson of grace basically goes like this. God is more interested in a relationship with you than anything. I'm serious. His number one priority is a relationship with you. More than anything. Not your goodness. Not your righteousness. Not your holiness. Not your morality. Not your sexual purity. God is more interested that time that you, that you said what you said to your parents. And, and it hurt and it was a lie. That doesn't disqualify you from the love of God. When you took that money, you kept that money, and you didn't give that money back, and you cheated, it doesn't disqualify you from God. When you yelled at your kids, it didn't disqualify you from the love of God. He still loves you. When you said what you said about your friend, that was so hurtful and was gossip. When you got an F on your paper, when you cheated on your paper, when you got pregnant and you weren't married. When your relationship failed, you couldn't keep it together. When you got a divorce. The hurtful things you say to yourself. The hurtful things you say to others. The thoughts you have that nobody knows because you'd be too embarrassed to share them. None of it. None of it keeps you from the love of God. He absolutely loves you. Enough to go to the cross and die for you. He wants a relationship with you. We must remember this verse. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. This is the God we serve. Is moral purity important? Absolutely. Jesus died because of our sins. Every time we sin, it hurts Him again. It, 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 it's, it's nuts. We can't go on and, and, and continue to just take our sins flippantly. But we have a whole new motivation. It's because He's with us and He loves us and it doesn't disqualify us. There's no reason we should ever be under the thumb of God and underneath Him in sorrow and worthlessness and shame. We should be with Him walking through life confessing daily every single mistake we make like even knowing that the ones we can't even remember or recall or we didn't even know we offended God are still covered in the grace because He's more interested in a relationship with you than anything. You and I have to believe that. Maybe this morning you were here and you feel worthless to God and to others. I want you to see something right now. If that is you, if you're sitting in here and you're feeling like, I, I, you don't know what I've done, you don't know what I've thought, you don't know what I've said, I feel, I feel worthless. I want you to see something this morning. I need the help of everybody else in this room. I want you to raise your hand if you have ever felt completely worthless before God. Some of you have two hands up. 
if this is you, you feel worthless, and you just looked around and you saw a room filled of worthless people who actually have worth, not because of who we are and what we've done, but because of who He is and what He has done on the cross. That is the only reason I can stand up here and even preach to you. It's the only reason Julie can sing. Oh, I know it's the only reason Julie can sing. And she'll admit it because she often says, we're not a perfect church. There's something wrong in Julie's psyche if she has to keep saying, we're not a perfect church. I want to make it clear. We're not. We're messed up. It's the reason why we love the song Amazing Grace. Because it talks about a wretch like me. And I'm a wretch. And He loves me. Anyway. And He loves you too. We want you to know that. We're going to offer an invitation and you may feel like, oh... I want to respond, but coming up front, so uncomfortable. I want you to know that we're all on your team. We want you to surrender. We want to celebrate it with you. There's so many people in this room that have already come forward asking for prayers or confessing or or just saying, I just want a relationship with Jesus or I want to turn my life around or I've wandered away from Him. I haven't been living for Jesus. We've heard this over and over again from each other because that's our testimonies. We invite you to come. And all you have to do, you don't have to share with anybody. You just share with me. and Just tell me what your need is, what your prayer is, what your hurt is. We would love to pray for you. We would love to help you. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus, show you how to have a relationship with Jesus. That's where my worth comes from. That's where our worth comes from. And it is amazing. I'm going to ask that you stand. We're going to pray. And the team is going to get in place while we're praying. And then we'll sing a song. And that's when I want you to slip out of your row and just come forward. Father God, thank You for saving a wretch like me. And thank You for this grace that is so much bigger than law and works and it it just covers it all and it it, Jesus fulfilled it Jesus came here and lived the life we weren't able to live and died for us for the sins that we all committed and rose again victorious over death so that we could be set free thank you thank you thank you I pray that you will draw hearts forward this morning and that you would help us to all be real with each other admitting that on our own we have no worth. But in Jesus, with Jesus, we have an eternity of worth because we're His friends. Thank You for that gift, that promise. Father, move hearts now. In Jesus' name. Amen.